well, now I'm going to really get to the sin. An unquenched fire in the flesh. A smoldering ember. An unquenched ember. And this is only for those who want to go on with him. This is only for those who say, whatever the cost, I want his fullness. Whatever it takes, Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. This is only for men who have a cry for righteousness. If you want to be like the crowd and go your way, you won't hear a word of this. But if God's been stirring you, you've been walking in brokenness before the Lord, you're going to hear it. You'll hear it. Ezekiel 15. Verse 7, I've set my face against, though they've come out of the fire, the fire will consume them. In other words, there's been a sort of deliverance. They've come out of this flashing fire. Let's suppose it was lust, the lust of the flesh. The lust itself has not been removed. There is still a lingering ember of lust. He's been delivered from the fire, and yet at the end, the fire consumes him because the embers are still burning. And the trouble is, we're going around flashing our x-rays and not getting the operation. X-rays don't heal. Isaiah 33, 13. You who are far away, hear what I have done. You who are near, acknowledge my might. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Now listen to this. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? Where's a man who, in his early ministry, has this thing break out in him, this failure, this breaking down of righteousness in the life, and it's not dealt with, it's continued year after year, it's covered and it's covered. There's layer after layer after layer of subjection. There's layer after layer. And I enjoyed what our pastor said. I'm so glad to hear that this morning, how God was getting through all those layers. He's doing that through all of us, getting through those layers that we've built up. Layer after layer of having pushed it down and not gotten to the very smoldering embers, that charring process that outwardly your branch can look so good, but there's a charring inside. It's burning inside and it's coming out until suddenly that black spot and there'll be a flashpoint. The Lord began to show me this past week, even, in, in this search, because I'm just now coming to the greatest hunger He's ever given to me to go on with Him, and He's been showing me some things that He was not ready to show me before. I said, well, Lord, I prayed all these months, and I've been open and coming to the light. Why didn't You show it to me? He said, you weren't listening yet. You weren't prepared to hear this, and if you'll hear this, you'll cross the line, and then I can use you. And he's showing me some things that have been there for years in my early ministry, some mistakes I made, some weaknesses I allowed. Saul was destroyed because of that smoldering ember. Saul was destroyed because of it. And there's a whole catalog of men in this book that have been destroyed because of it. He said, you've got a heart toward me now. You've made up your mind. You're going all the way with me. And I'm going to let you be afflicted. I'm going to allow things in your life that confuse you because I'm trying to get at something. It's a furnace of affliction. But then he says, when you're in that affliction and perhaps even coming out, then if you've developed a listening ear, I'm going to show you that you've got to pluck out those roots now. There's got to be a circumcision of your heart. And I, I guess I've been rejoicing because I thought there was no evidence. I wasn't doing it outwardly. But you can still have those roving eyes. You can still have that smoldering ember. You know, God wants to circumcise that. He wants to get at that root and have that plucked out. Absolutely plucked out so that God says, Brother, sister, you've crossed that line. I know your heart's for me now. I know your heart's for me now. I proclaim to you new things from this time, from even hidden things which you've not known. Listen, I told you the glory of His name is linked to the holiness of our character, and that lingering evil in us can profane His name. How do I get that smoldering ember? Because there was no outward expression of it, I thought I could live with it. The Lord says, no, now I want the root. I want the root of it. I want you to have total freedom. I don't want you ever feared again in your life, ever. I want you to walk anywhere, look any man in the eye. I want you to walk in that freedom. If you come to light, he'll show it to you. He dug it out of me and said, David, I'm going to get the roots out of you. Usually, most of the time, it has to do with lust. That's right. Lust, which comes from the root of pride. All these sins come from pride. Do you have a hearing ear this morning? He's given you the listening ear so that he can tell you what that last root is that hinders you from being totally used. And I'll tell you what, he's not about to pour on you a spirit of usefulness with that thing still smoldering. Because if he does and he raises your branch and you can be seen among the masses of the branches high and lifted up, even though it's to the glory of his name, it's going to break out there at that height and you'll bring reproach to his name beyond anybody else. He'll not use you. He'll let you go so far. He'll cause you just to level off and then there'll be a slow decline. You'll wind up in a wilderness and you'll start withering because you're not hearing. 
I just come to the light. Only the holy are as bold as a lion. Only the righteous. Your boldness comes from your righteousness of Christ. Your walk with God is what gives you your boldness. Circumcise yourself. Heart. Lord, circumcise us. Saints, I feel God doing something profound in our hearts. I'm glad I came just for what he, He's been doing in me. He's really been doing something in me. I know He's doing something in your heart right now. Hallelujah. Lord, go deep this morning. Forgive us for our gossiping lips, our unclean lips, unclean hearts. Lord, if our lips are unclean, our hearts are not being dealt with. Help us to deal with it this morning. He wants all the sin out, purged, so we walk in freedom. And let's just say, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your mercy this morning. And you've been talking to us in love. Thank you, Jesus. taking this people out of Israel and putting them into a promised land. Now the Bible says very clearly that this is the smallest nation, the most insignificant of all nations and people. They're just a small handful and God chooses them. Now why is he bringing them here to a testing place and why is he going to take them into the land of Canaan? Is it because he just wants to give them new houses and he's got a special people he wants to just bless and they're going to inherit vineyards and milk and honey and they're going to be able to sit idle in pleasure and they're going to just be able to sit there and praise and worship God and offer sacrifices from generation to generation. No, 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 no. You see, God loves the world, the Bible says, and God loved the world just as much then as he loves him now. God was love from the beginning. The Bible says that prophetically all the prophets knew that the law would go out from Jerusalem, that God was trying to raise up missionaries with a testimony. He was trying to build an army that he could use, that his truth could go out through the whole then known world. They were not going into Canaan land just for their own comfort. They weren't going to go there to so that all of the goodness and grace of God could be absorbed in themselves. Not at all. That's not why God saved you and that's not why he saved me. God is out always searching and looking for an army, looking for a people that are tested and tried and have proven him faithful. Because it's not just going out and preaching an unproven gospel. If you haven't proved the gospel, you can't believe the gospel you preach. God is trying to produce something in these people. God wanted them, they're standing on the brink of a catastrophe. They're standing on the brink of a disaster, a crisis like they've never known. You say, well, does God expect these people to trust Him when the army is coming down and everything looks impossible? God expects them to trust and believe Him and not doubt their situation? Yes. Absolutely. For without faith it's impossible to please Him. And they that come to Him believe, must believe that He is, that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God is trying to produce a people with faith and confidence in Him to become messengers, tested and tried. But you see, God can't do anything where there is no faith, where there is all doubt. God in flesh couldn't do it and wouldn't do it. Jesus couldn't do mighty miracles there because of their doubt and their unbelief. He rebuked the Red Sea, the scripture says in verses 9 to 12, and it was dried up and he saved them. He redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Then believed they his words. Then sang they his praises. After you get a good report and after you've got victory and after you've seen deliverance, anybody can sing. The Bible said, then they believed his words. Folks miserably failed because the very next verse reads, they soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel. They despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word. Oh, folks, I believe God is still searching for that people, that people who will be his greatest evangelistic tool. You see, God's not looking for some highly educated seminarian to take the gospel to the world. He's not looking for mega churches with multiplied thousands of people who've never been tested and tried. 
They don't look at reality. And then when the hard times come, when the testing times come, there are no resources. There's nothing to draw on. And God can't use that kind of a people to be a testimony to a lost world. Not at all. He's not looking for that. Gideon had called for the nation to come and fight the Midianites. And many thousands responded to his call. Got it down finally to 300 tested men. God is not looking for some great, powerful religious organization. He's looking for individuals. He's looking for men and women of God who have been through the flood, who have been through the fire, who have been tested and have come through with faith, tested as gold, tried in the fire. I want to tell you, the world is looking. The world is watching for people like that. Not to just throw scriptures around, not just trying to get everybody to come to their church, but coming on the job when everybody on that job knows that you're going through the trial of your life. You're facing calamity. You're going to work even though you are broken and you have a heart that you can hardly stand the day. You've been rocked by hard times. Please don't tell me that you're making a commitment to faith unless you're also making three other commitments. A commitment to this word daily. A commitment to your knees so that you're not in situational faith at all, but you're developing a relationship. It's a relationship faith. And also, you've come to understand how much God loves you. And you know how I'm convinced of His love? On my knees and in this book. I read of His love, and then the Holy Spirit reveals it to me in the secret closet of prayer. From the 121st Psalm, the Lord is thy keeper. Is your shade upon the right hand. The sun will not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He's preserved thy soul. God said, I'm your keeper. I'm your preserver. I'll keep you. I'll preserve you. Trust me. This message is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 903 903- 963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. Lord, I need a quickening of my body and my spirit and my mind that the word that you have pressed on my heart will be delivered and received and bear fruit for your honor and glory. Hallelujah. Lord, we've gathered here to hear you. Holy Spirit, I call on you now to give us hearing ears. I call on you to touch my body and give me strength. Lord, this, it, it, it's been a long journey. It's been a heavy burden, but Lord, you have been there to lift that. And Lord, there are many now need to just lean on you. We pray, Lord, as we talk about trusting you this afternoon, that you will teach us to trust. Lord, we want to trust you, but we don't know how. We're so prone to doubt and unbelief. God, forgive us and touch us and give us strength, Lord, so that we can not only make it through, but we can be overcomers in these last days. Overcomers in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My question, my, my message isn't form of a question. Do you really trust God? Do you really trust God? Now, I got some good amens there. But let's look at it for just a minute. We preach a lot about trusting God. And we've heard numerous numerous messages about trusting God right from this pulpit. I know I've preached a lot about trusting God. And we all we all want to trust Him. We all say, uh, you know, when God meets us and delivers us, we say, I am really going to trust God the rest of my life. Have you ever said that as I have? Lord, I'll never doubt you again. God, you've been so good. I prayed and you undertook. And, and now, Lord, I don't ever let me doubt you again until the next crisis, until the next hard place, when it looks like God is not hearing and he's ans- not answering our prayer on our time schedule. And that's when the panic becomes, uh, sets in again. And if I, if I ask you, do you trust God? Mo- most of you have uh, either whispered or said amen to that. The Holy Spirit... 
uh, question to me. And he said, first of all, do you really believe that I'm able to do everything that I promised you to do? Am I able to do it? And then, do you believe that as God, I am faithful to do what I promised you to do? And finally, if you believe that I'm able and that I'm faithful to keep my word, do you believe that I'm willing to do what I am able and faithful to do? And of course, we say, yes, yes, yes. We believe all of that. But then the Holy Ghost begins to, to search us out, and then we look at the telltale signs of doubt that creeps in. And I want to talk about that for just a minute. Because God has always been looking for a people who will trust him. God's had, yes, he's had a problem getting people to pray, but he's had a bigger problem getting them to trust. He's, he, he has people that willing to go to church and work and work and work for him, but to find a people that he can point to and say, there is one that really trusts me at all times. No matter what happens, here's an example of one who really believes and trusts in me. Now, <clears throat> let me list you a few of the dealings of the Holy Spirit in my heart about this matter of trusting God. Folks, I'm like you. I want to trust God more than anything in my life. I want to be an example. I, it's not just so I can walk around and say, hey, there goes a man of faith. I get sick and tired of people talking about certain evangelists. Boy, he, there's a man of power and great faith. If, folks, uh, if, 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 if there is a man of power and great faith, you don't have to, he doesn't have to talk about it. He doesn't advertise himself uh, that way. It'll just have an effect quietly on people all around him. And say, same with you, it'll have an effect on people. But there are some telltale signs that we're really not trusting God with all of our heart. Now, as a pastor, I'm just going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you now. It's not that I don't have energy. I've got energy. And you know I can scream. <laughs> but I want to talk to you right out of my heart. First of all, if you and I really have trust in God, it's going to show on our countenance. It's going to show on our face. My face is not just the front of my head. It's a testimony. And really, the only way people can read us is, uh, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. It, it can be the curl of your mouth. The one that's up is a smile, the one that's down is a frown. I honestly believe that many of us are getting a lot of wrinkles because we don't have trust in God. Now, that's not the only reason. I've got a lot of reasons why mine are coming. It has to do with age. But the question was put to me by the Holy Spirit. If you really trust me, David, if you really believe that I'm God with all the ability and faithfulness and willingness, why sometimes you go around so cast down? Why do you look like your God is dead? Do you go on the job as, and, and you, you say, I know I trust God, but what about the way you walk around your family? Sister, wives, what's it like when you get up in the morning? What do you, no, I'm not gonna ask you what you look like. That was the wrong question. Let me. How do I put it? I'm in a hole. Help me. <laughs> do your, does your husband or your wife, when you get up, have to put up with the scowl and a frown and a depressed spirit of murmuring and complaining? Because you see, if you really had trust in God, you would believe that there's no problem in your life that he can't work out that no matter what the weight is on you, no matter what your family problem is, before you went to bed, you committed it to the Lord. When you got up in the morning, you didn't pick it up because he said you'd have cast all your care upon him and leave it there. You heard me tell, I think I've told it two or three times, I was walking down 51st Street and I had a weight of problems on my head and I was downcast and a girl sitting there stoned high. She said, oh look, it can't be that bad, mister. She's a junkie. I smiled quick, I'll tell you. Now, David loved the Lord with all of his heart. Here's a man of God who preached and, and sang and taught more about trusting God than any man in the Scriptures. Listen to his testimony. He said, My soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings I will make my refuge until all my calamities be past. He said, in all my calamities, all my trials, I'll just trust God. And then he says, oh, thou my God, 
save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Now David faced insurmountable troubles. You, you remember the trouble he had when all of his men turned against him uh, at Ziglag and, and uh, lost everything. And he, he encouraged himself in the Lord and trusted in God. And time after time after time in front of a lion, in front of a bear, in front of the Philistines, and everywhere he goes, he's casting his care and he's trusting on God. But a time came when David was overwhelmed with a sinking feeling. Something came over David. And I don't know what the problem was, and I don't know what the circumstances were, but something happened in David that caused him to be cast down in his countenance and, and in his spirit. He, he asked, why are you cast down on my soul? Why have you been disquieted in me? And he repeats it two times in Psalm 42, 11 and 43, 5. You, you say, well, well, maybe it's because uh, that's the time he had an affair with Bathsheba. Maybe there's sin in his life. But if you read the first part of uh, chapter 42, uh, where he mentioned his soul cast down, here's how it begins. As the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, the living God. My tears have been my meat night and day. I pour out my soul in me. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise. Here's a man. That's not a backslid man. That's not a man living in sin. Man, he, he's seeking God. He's panting after the Lord. He's thirsting for God. He's got tears night and day pouring out his soul in intercession. And he's going to the house of God rejoicing with joy and praise and thanksgiving. And yet in the midst of all that... <clears throat> He wakes up one day, and he can't explain it. I, I, I can't put my finger, I, I am down, and I can't get out. Why? He, he didn't know why. He couldn't explain it. Here he is on one side praising. He's righteous. He's walking with God, but he, ha he is down. There's some kind of, uh, <laughs> something has grabbed a hold of his spirit, and he can't explain it. He said, oh, my God, my soul is cast down. Why? Why have I been cast down? Have you ever been in that position? Where, where, where you can't explain, you get up one day and there it is. And you cannot put your finger on it. it Maybe a combination of things that you've been able to overcome. You push them aside or you thought you'd committed them to the Lord and you wake up one day and it just accumulates and suddenly <clears throat> you wake up one day and as David, you say, my soul is disquieted. I am disturbed is what he's saying. I am disturbed and I can't tell you why. I love God, I pray, I seek the Lord. And you say, well, that shouldn't happen to a praying, believing Christian, but it does. It's happened to me, it'll happen to you. If it didn't happen already, wait. <laughs> it's coming. In spite of the spiritual hunger, there was a dispute. He said, why do I go mourning because of oppression? Why am I mourning? There's this sense of mourning about him. <clears throat> and he said, deep, in the same chapter, he says, deep is calling to deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and billows are gone over me. Now he's beginning to understand. He said, there's something deep going on inside of me. God's trying to do something in me. I, th I thought I really had this thing of trust figured out. I've written about it, I sang about it, I've taught about it. But he said, now God's putting me to a deep test. Deep inside, he's, deep is calling to deep. The deep work of the Holy Spirit's going down deep into my innermost to try to bring me to a place that I've not been yet regarding trust and faith in God. He said, and, and what's happened, God has allowed his waves and his billows to roll over him. These are called thy waves. They're, they're not David's, they're not the devil's. He said, thy billows and thy waves you've allowed to come over me. And now the waves are hitting him of trouble and, and discouragement. And pro it, it could be anything. For with you and I, it could be finances, it can be children, it can be marriage, it can be so many things. The billows begin to roll over us. And in the process, deep is calling to deep. God is reaching down into the innermost, saying, you have not yet learned to trust me. You said you did, you thought you did, but you've not yet learned that in all things, <clears throat> I am God Almighty, and I, I am allowing these waves to hit you. I'm going to bring you to a place where you have to call out on me, and I'm going to bring you to a place in such depth I'm going to bring fire, and I'm going to be floods, 
And I'm doing it because I'm preparing you, I'm training you to trust me so that you can come to a place that no matter what happens, because the Bible said evil men will wax worse and worse. The Bible said the floods of iniquity are coming. The Bible predicts the devil is going to send a flood of iniquity against the body of Jesus Christ. And he has got to have a people who have learned to trust him in everything. And he said, I'm going to let waves come. These waves won't sink you. These waves won't drown you. You're not going to get hurt by this fire. But you're going to learn in this to trust me with everything in you. You're going to come to a place where you give up totally trying to figure things out. You give up totally trying to understand in the flesh how to overcome. You're going to lean on me. You're going to just surrender to my will. Hallelujah. See, God's not interested in you just getting your next victory. He's interested in you becoming surrendered to his will, period. He wants us surrendered. He'll just keep them coming till we reach surrender. Once you surrender and resign to his perfect will, that's when the calm begins. That's when the waters are stilled by his voice. <clears throat> there was something deep inside his question. You, you know, the, the Puritans said, troubles come in battalions. Did you ever notice troubles never come one at a time? How many know that? Oh, come on now. If you got trouble, you don't have one trouble. You, I bet you could list a dozen troubles to me. If you got one, you got a dozen. <clears throat> they come in battalions. They learned that hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> Man, anybody can tell you that. David said, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? In other words, Lord, what's going on? But you see, God's calling him to a place beyond all his doubts. He still has doubts, or he wouldn't be asking why. And God is dealing with David in this now. And, and it's showing on his countenance now. He used to sing. He used to praise the Lord. He had a beautiful countenance, the Scripture said. <clears throat> but he's got an impatient heart now. He's become impatient with God. <clears throat> it was not just... David's enemies that said, where is thy God? They were taunting David, where's your God? But that's the same thing was going on in David's heart. God, where are you? It was not just his enemies, it's David saying that. God, where are you? I have prayed, I've sought you, I don't see the answer to my prayer. Now, every Christian listening to me now in this place knows what it's like to intercede and pray and you, you have given him what you thought was ultimate faith that you're capable of. <clears throat> Even though it's just childlike faith, you've prayed and it hasn't happened. Frankly, you did not get your answer. And you're saying, why God, why, why have you not answered me? Why do I go mourning all the day? <clears throat> Five, David says in the same chapter, hope thou in God, hope in God. In the original Hebrew, it reads, Wait patiently on God, for I shall yet give him thanks. Wait patiently on God. God's getting, the reason he's going down deep, he's getting now to the real issue. You know what the real issue is? A spirit of impatience. He's a little peeved at God for not working on his time schedule. David got the idea, Lord, it's too late. Uh, it's past time he, he came to the end of his faith folks you can't come to the end of your faith and then it's not faith but there there we we are an impatient people especially americans and i don't care what country you come from you live here in america one year you're going to catch it <laughs> go to mcdonald's if if they're five minutes late I saw a man the other day, he couldn't wait. I, I was over McDonald's on 9th, and he was waiting there, and the girl was doing something, and he said, oh, forget it, and walked out. It's not enough that he's going to have fast food, he's going to have it now, fast food. <laughs> I think this instant everything has gotten into our walk with God. I believe in Holy Ghost timing. 
I believe there's a time when God says, I will answer you in my time, in my way, and not one hour, one minute before. Whether you understand it, whether you like it or not, I am not going to do it until everything is right. Cry and pray and scream all you want. God says, I know when. And if you'll resign to my when, I'll do it in my way, in my time. And when I do it, I'll do it suddenly. Suddenly it'll be there. David had it out with his soul, as if to say to his heart, now settle down, soul. You're impatient, you're upset, you're fretting, you're angry, you're accusing the Lord of not being concerned because you have impatience in you. Things have not turned out the way you prayed, and it got to you. And folks, sometimes it just gets to you. And that's, what, that's where some of you are right now. David saying, but soul, you're going to hope in God. You're going to remember all of God's faithfulness in your past. You remember that God has always brought you through every trouble and every trial. He that delivered you in the past will deliver you now. <clears throat> David said, I shall praise him who is the health of my countenance, who is the good look on my face, what it really means. It's the happiness that is expressed on my countenance. It's the rest and the peace. I've got to acknowledge to you, I don't always have that. I have to work at that. I really have to work at that. There's a tendency to get up in the morning to think of all the things you have to do and all the burdens on your back and start picking them up and put them on your back. And then by the time you get to the bathroom and look in the mirror, <clears throat> You had to say, who's that? <laughs> I'm not talking about the hair everywhere and the beard and uh, all of the stuff they put on their faces. I'm, I'm talking about a spirit that comes on us that affects our countenance, that sadness, that, that, that droopiness. I shall praise him who is the health of my countenance. Joel prophesied of a time when there would be great fear and gloom that would cover the whole earth. He said, the people shall be much pained, and their faces shall gather darkness. There's going to be a darkness on their face. Listen, you people that are from outside New York, have you, have you looked at the faces around here? Have you seen? Have you walked down Broadway and seen? How many smiles have you seen? God help us if people stand right outside of Times Square Church and don't see. I don't want to see people coming away from this church the way they come out of these theaters. I walked by a theater that was dismissing the other night, and, and people were coming. I didn't understand that. I, that, that, wasn't, that was nothing. That was nothing. They spent 75 bucks a piece for nothing. And they're coming out, long faces, lighting up their cigarettes. There's not a smile anywhere. Their faces are darkened, the scripture says. And it's our faces all around you are going to get darker and darker. That means more gloom and more doom. There's sadness such as you've never seen. You see it on the faces. Uh, I was in a restaurant last week, and I, I saw a young couple. And the whole time, they're, they're just like they're about to break, like they're about to cry. The burden of the world upon them. Jeremiah warned Jude and Israel of a day of great trembling and fear and not of peace. And all the faces shall become pale. This pale, the, the blood rushes out from them because there's no hope. No hope. But folks, God wants to change our countenance. I honestly believe that people who really trust God have better health than anybody else. Because I believe unbelief affects your body. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not suggesting that everything that you go through is a result of unbelief. Sometimes it has to do with the way we eat. It has to do with our lifestyle. It has to do with so many other things, sometimes testings of the Lord. But I tell you that the Bible says right now, He is the health, health of my countenance. It's not just that He puts a smile on my face, but if, he get, if, I, if my soul is at rest, my stomach is not putting out this acid. If my soul is at rest, my nerves are not shaky. 
If I believe God and I've put all my burdens on him and I really trust the Lord, there's a calm that comes. There's a peace that passes all understanding. That's got to affect your health. For, for years I had colitis. That's a Latin word that means collide. A problem, you hit a problem and it breaks out in your body. Some people get headaches, it, it just affects the body. And, and uh, with a combination of nutrition and confidence and rest in the Lord, I told the Lord last year, I can't go like this. I'm not going to do it anymore. You have to bring me to that rest. Now, that rest that's promised in Hebrews is simply a resignation to the will of God and committing yourselves wholeheartedly to the will of God. Sink or swim, live or die. I'm the Lord's, and I'm going to put my life in his hands. Whatever, if I, have, if I lose everything and have to live in a tent... If I have to live in a, just on the street, I will trust him. I'm not going to let these things get to me. He is the health of my countenance. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'll go with you to the end. So no matter what we go through, he said, I'm with you. And as long as he's with us, that should bring us the confidence that we need. By the way, folks, trusting in God is not an option. I used to think, well, if I don't trust God, I'm the only one that suffers. I, I, I may lose the blessing, but that's not so. The Bible says it's a curse. And it deeply offends God. It offends the Lord. People, we think that drugs and alcohol and homosexuality and all these things offend the Lord. I'm telling you, those were not the things that kept Israel out of the promised land. It was unbelief. This is the sin that grieves God more than any other sin. Of course, all these other sins are a result of unbelief. They stem from unbelief that causes pride in flesh. I want you to go with me to Jeremiah, 17th chapter. 17th chapter of Jeremiah. By the way, you know what the Bible says? You have need of patience after you've done the will of the Father that you might receive the promise. You have need of patience. If you've got an impatient spirit, take it to the Lord and ask him to forgive you and give you a waiting heart on him. Hallelujah. All right, I want you to go to Jeremiah 17. Let's start verse 5. If you have King James, just follow me. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Look this way, folks. This is the curse of all who will not trust fully in God and lean on the arm of flesh. That means your own flesh or the flesh of somebody else, rather than taking it to God and resigning to his perfect will and believing that he's going to answer your prayer. It's running off trying to make it work, trying to manipulate, make telephone calls. I mean, just go at it trying to make it work. This happens in relationships when somebody's praying for a mate sometimes and God seems to have been delaying the answer. So what, what do some do? They, they manipulate. They go and trust the flesh. And what you get is a fleshly mate. You don't get a spiritual mate. You get what you went after. You get flesh. Because flesh creates flesh. And, and you won't wait on God. You won't wait for his time. You say, well, I'm, I'm getting older. I've got to move. I've got to do something about it. Nobody will want me. I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm telling you that there's a curse that goes with trying to take matters in your own hands. There's a curse. You know what that curse is? A perpetual dryness. You're like a heath in the desert. That, that, that's that's a, just a sprig that's got thorns on it. There's no leaves. There's no fruit. There's nothing of beauty. It's just, it's just there in a dry wilderness. It's a dryness. It's an emptiness. There's no fruit. He, he, he's literally good. Cursed is the man that trusts in man, makes flesh his arm, whose heart departed from the Lord. Depart, all, always in the scripture, when you depart from the Lord, it's departing from faith. They've departed from faith in him, 
This person shall be like the heath or the shrub in the desert and shall not see when good cometh. This person will never have their prayer answered. They'll never see the good that they desire, the very thing that they think will bring some peace or satisfaction. There'll be no good that's, that comes out of it. And even the good things, like the rain from heaven, all it does is give growth to the thorns. It gives growth to that which is fruitless and empty. In other words, the emptiness grows. The, 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 the uh, fruitlessness becomes unbearable in a desert dry place. Folks, I don't want to be in a desert. I don't want to live my Christian life dry and empty without fruit. But that's what unbelief brings. Verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots. The Lord said, I'm going to plant you. You're not even going to depend on the rain. You're going to have living water. You're going to go down deep where the water is always there. You don't have to wait for the rain. This is the end of side one. People, you even sing it, send the rain, send the rain, Lord, because a lot of people are dry and they need rain. But those that are planted by the Holy Ghost, those who believe God explicitly, are taking root down into the eternal river of the Holy Spirit's life and power and rivers. He said, you will always be green. You will always be fruitful. That spreadeth out her roots by the river. Shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green. And shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Folks, I want to bear fruit to the day I die. I want to be a green tree with life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's a story in the 30th chapter of <clears throat> Isaiah. In, in the 30th chapter of Isaiah, <clears throat> Israel has a, a problem. They've got a, an army coming against them, Assyrians coming against them. Listen to me. <clears throat> there is nothing more dangerous than sharp minds making plans without God. Nothing more dangerous. They call it strategizing, networking. Let me tell you again, there's nothing more dangerous than men and women of God with sharp minds making their own plans. Without trusting God, without consulting with the Holy Ghost, without being led by God. I've heard, I've heard ministers stand in the pulpit and preach, look, God gave us a good mind, use it. Yes, use it. But only after consulting the Holy Ghost and after getting directions from Him and not leaning on the arm of the flesh. I, 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 I talked to a, a, a brother who had, was pastor of a great church, and one of his friends told me, he said, you know, he, he could do this without the Holy Ghost. He's so bright. He could be CEO of a big corporation. This guy's a brain. He, he, he does this on his brain. They, in the 30th chapter, they, their princes, rather than seek the face of God, they, they've got a delegation, they've got a, an ambassadorship going down to Haines in Egypt, and, and uh, they're, they're loaded down with donkeys and camels full of gold and silver and precious jewels to bribe the Egyptian army to come and fight for them. Now, had they been walking in faith, they would have known that just a few could put ten thousands to chase. That God would fight their battles. They had believed God in the past, but now they're going to do this in their own strength. God spoke, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord. Verse 1, Who execute a plan, but not my plan. They make an alliance, but not of my spirit. Who proceed, verse 2, to go down to Egypt without consulting me. And when God's saying, you don't trust me anymore, you're doing it your own way, you don't seek me for direction. Verse, th verse 15, the scripture says, in quietness, in trust is your strength, but you are not willing. In quietness and trust is your strength. How many see that in verse 15? 
If you really believe God, you're going to have a quietness of spirit. You're not going to be uptight. You're going to be relaxed. You're saying, God's got everything under control. God's taking care of this. You may not see it, but you say, God's taking care of it. This ought, to, this ought to be the talk of Christians. God's taking care of it. My God has everything under control. My God's doing it. His way, His time. I rest in it. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. They went down to Egypt, tried to bribe Pharaoh's army. But they were rejected and they came home in shame. Now the prophet Isaiah is crying aloud to them, Now go home and rest in God. Turn back to Him. Be calm and quiet and trust in Him and you'll be delivered. <clears throat> when they came to the end of themselves, now, in essence, it was said, now you trusted me, wait on me. The Egyptians are men, they're not God. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. But when I stretched out my hand, they shall all fall together. The Lord of hosts shall come down to fight for Mount Zion. Then shall the Assyrians fall, not with the sword of man, but the sword of the Lord. Hallelujah. Not the sword of man, but the sword of the Lord. The scripture is absolutely full of story after story of men, even like Asa. Asa was a man who did right in the sight of God. He was a man of faith. And one time Zerah, the Ethiopian king, came against him with a million-man army. He had 300 iron chariots. And Asa was outnumbered three to one. And his army looks at that massive army that is filling the valleys, coming at him. And he trusted God. Now, he didn't gather them together and say, look, you all have bright minds. You're all military leaders. Anybody got a plan? If they were American Christians, you know what they'd do? Yeah, we got a plan. We'll call it BAM. Beat Assyrians. <clears throat> millions. Beat Assyrian millions. They'd have some catchy title to it. They'd be strategizing and trying to figure it all out, and they'd lose the battle. But look at what Asa did. And Asa cried to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it's nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name do we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa, and the Ethiopians fled. They were overthrown that they could never recover themselves. No strategy, no planning of the flesh, the calling on the name of the Lord in faith and confidence in Him. Now I know that there are people, and I'm gonna close right now, there are, th this is the reason the Lord put this message on my heart this afternoon. There's, there's some of you really going through a, uh, a period right now where you're just a little impatient <clears throat> You can't understand how you can go much longer either in your finances. You can't go much longer the way things are in your home. You don't know how you're going to be able to hold out because your spirit's troubled. You're really going through it. All through the service, I was sitting over here thinking about this altar call now. What I was supposed to, I want you to stand if you will, please. Folks, need to look this way for a moment. I dearly love this congregation. Everyone. And I feel his burden for you this, this afternoon. <clears throat> what is that prayer that you've been praying? That miracle that's needed in your life? A deliverance that has to come. Something God promised you and you still don't see it. And because you haven't seen it, there's just something deep down inside that's saying, Lord, why and when? And your faith is beginning to waver. Now, he's mad, not mad at you, but he, you see, it does, it's not that God curses you because of unbelief. But unbelief brings its own curse of dryness. 
and fruitlessness and emptiness. The Lord says, I don't want that for you. I want you to take root. I want to plant you. And I want you to bear fruit. And I want you to have life. I want you to enjoy me. Folks, God wants you to enjoy. Some of you don't even enjoy life at all. You don't even know what it's like. You haven't enjoyed the Lord really since you've known him. You walk through life so sad, so down, so weary. The Lord wants to lift that load. And the only way you can do it is if you resign to him and say, Lord, I will trust you. I'm not going to try to figure this out, but Lord, you've got to bring a rest to me. I said that one time in my life. I said, God, I can't serve you this way. I can't serve you with a dryness in me. I can't serve you feeling down all the time. I can't, I, I, Lord, I want peace. I want joy. And I, wanna, I want to enjoy you. I remember one time in my life praying, Jesus, I can't walk with you unless I enjoy you. I want to enjoy you. I want the peace that you offer me. I, I don't want it to, to be just a sermon I preach. I want to experience it. Lord, I want to enjoy you. You can't enjoy the Lord if you're impatient with him. You can't enjoy him if you're asking why. Now, he understands it, but he wants you to come to a place where he said, Lord, I'm going to take a step of faith, and I'm going to ask you to just take everything that I have on my back now, and I'm going to roll it on you. You've heard that before, but you have to take an actual step of faith and say, Lord, I commit everything that's in my life to you now. And I want you to bring a joy. And from this day on, I am asking you to help me to enjoy my walk with you. So that there'll be a smile on my face. There'll be a rest in me. I won't be uptight. God wants to take that uptightness out of you. He wants you to relax in him. He said, in quietness and peace shall be your strength. Quietness and trust shall be your strength. Quietness, because you trust him, is going to be a strength to you. Do you want to enjoy him? Now, now folks, I, I, I know what I'm talking about. Some of you have not really enjoyed him like he wants to be enjoyed. He wants you to enjoy him. I'm a father. I have four children, 11 grandchildren. Nothing pleases me more when they get joy out of my presence. I, I get joy when I know that they love to be with me. That I'm not some dictator. I'm not grouchy grandpa. <laughs> I told you the only, of all the visions I've heard about of heaven, people had visions of heaven. The only one I really enjoyed and truly believed was the little boy who said, I, I went to heaven and Jesus played ball with me. I believe that more than all the golden dreams. Yes, I do believe in the gold. I believe in all that. But I, I believe that I have a Jesus who delights in me. And he wants me to delight in him and to be at rest with him and be at peace, not be uptight. If that's you, if I've explained you, come on down. Come on. Bring it to Jesus right now, up in the balcony, in the main floor. Say, so I'm not leaving this all until I lay this thing down. I can't live like this. I'm not going to live like this. Jesus, I want to enjoy you. I want to trust you. I want to lay all my unbelief down and say, God, I commit it to you now. I am not going to live like this. What's your word for the people who come forward? And I, I, Lord told me to go to 86th Psalm. And here's what I read when I turned here. Bow down your ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I'm poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful to me, O Lord. I cry to you every day. Rejoice, my soul, O Lord. I lift up my soul to you, for thou art, Lord, are good. You're ready to forgive. You're plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. You will answer me. Now look at me, please. You've got to take a step of faith. 
Faith alone is going to, that's the only deliverance you can have out of any of the things that I was talking about today. <sighs> that I know the majority of you here just love the Lord with all your heart. Just I can't live with this burden on me anymore. But that's a self-imposed burden. It's not the burden of the Lord. It's your own burden. Lay it down by faith. Say, Lord, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to enjoy you. You will enjoy him once you know that he loves you and he's cleansed you. That when you ask forgiveness and you pray and cry to him, he hears and delivers. Is there anybody here would doubt that he forgives you and cleanses you if you ask him? You accept that cleansing. You accept that forgiveness. You accept it now in Jesus' name and say, Lord, I know you delight in me. Help me to delight in you now. I delight my soul in the Lord, then David said. He is my delight. My delight. Will you pray this prayer with me? Everybody that came forward, Jesus. I have a heavy burden on me, a burden I can't understand. I don't know what it's about, but I bring it to you, Lord. I don't want to carry that anymore. I've confessed my sins to you now. Lord, there's nothing between us because of your blood. You've forgiven me. And by faith you've cleansed me. Now, Lord Jesus, come by your Holy Spirit and lift this burden from me. Forgive my unbelief. Forgive my fear. Oh, God, this fear that is in me is of my own doing. It's the fear of man, fear of failure, fear that I'm not pleasing you, fear that I'm not doing right. And it's a burden of the flesh. But it's not your burden. So I reject this burden. I cast it aside. I lay it down at your feet. Now lift it from me. Oh Jesus, give me your joy. I want to enjoy you, Lord. I want your joy in my heart. Let me say with David, Rejoice my heart, O oh Lord. For I will praise you. Now lift your hands and just praise him right now, Lord. I praise you. I worship you. I give you praise, O oh Lord. You will deliver your people. Now something else I want. I want the whole church to begin to thank God that the prayer you've been praying is being shipped to you. It's on the way. His time and his way, he will ship it to you. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you thanks. You are going to answer. You will not fail your people. That answer may not come in the form that you thought it should come, but in the form that it comes, it'll be better than what you asked for. It'll be just what you need. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the tape.